Hello, this is an explanation of the literary terms found in the book you're going to be reading called The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. This story uses the motif or a, a general framework of a murder mystery. And the parts of a murder mystery that you need to be aware of, a lot of these you probably can figure out on your own, is that it's a puzzle to be solved. It's a mystery or crime that needs to be solved. And uh, the mystery has to have, usually, a victim. Uh, someone dies or there's a crime or someone's charged with a crime that they didn't commit. Um, and we get to see them in, in their worst case scenario. And then we learn about them through flashbacks or testimony or, or other pieces of information that are shared throughout the investigation. Um, and there's also a main character who is the person who's looking for the answers, the detective. It could be an actual police detective, it could be a private investigator, or if you watch the Hallmark Channel, it could be a florist or someone who owns a bakery who apparently has way too much time on their hands. Um, they also have ones where they have uh, like doctors or coroners are de detectives and solve mysteries. And there, of course, has to be suspects, the who done it. Um, they have to figure out who possibly could have committed the crime and what their motive would be. Um, the motive is the reason why they would have committed the crime. Like, what would have caused them to kill another person, or in this story's case, a dog? And the investigation just starts off with over clues, like the body. They do an autopsy and they figure out information about what happened. It could be the murder weapon that gets left behind or a footprint. There's also hidden evidence. Um, you could find out that maybe there was something, um, uh, maybe a mysterious safety deposit box key in the victim's pocket. And they have to figure out where that key is for and what's in the box and maybe how it ties in. So there's hidden evidence sometimes that they have to look for. There's also large gaps in information. Uh, they don't want to tell you too much because they want you to figure it out as you're going along and keep you in suspense, which is the next item. Um, they don't give you the answers until the end of the story to keep you enjoyably reading along and trying to figure it out on your own. And they use two clues called foreshadowing and a red herring to keep you in suspense. Uh, foreshadowing I'm going to talk about on the next slide. The red herring is a kind of foreshadowing that basically sets one of the suspects up to look like they're the ones who did it. But by the end, you figure like, wait a minute, they didn't do it and it was a distraction all the way along. Um, as I said, I was going to come back to foreshadowing, um, one of our literary devices. And it's when the author hints or mentions something uh, that's about to happen. And it is done on purpose because the human brain will try very, very hard to figure out how we're going to get from where we're at now to where this piece of information that just got foreshadowed, how we're going to do that. So the brain's trying very hard to figure that out, and then it gathers more information as the story continues. Another uh, piece of literary strategy they use uh, to help us understand situations to make comparisons is an illusion. Um, an illusion is where you make reference uh, to a people, places, events, or literary works, um, and making a connection. It's like a metaphor with a proper noun in there, or some kind of event that people know about. So if you don't know who Romeo and Juliet are, it doesn't make a lot of sense to say he's a real Romeo with the ladies, because you have to understand what you're alluding to in order to get what the meaning is. So comparing this guy to a Romeo means that he's really romantic and he can sweet talk uh, women into falling in love with him in a matter of hours. But if you don't know who Romeo is, it's not going to do a lot of good to make the illusion. Um, Christopher, the character in the story, sometimes heads off on what he calls a digression. So where you depart from the story, you're kind of going off the beaten path. Um, sometimes you have friends who go into digressions when they're telling a story, like, okay, stick to the point, what are you trying to tell me? Well, the digressions in this story actually don't end up being digressions. They almost always tie back in to give us character development or help us figure out some piece of information about the plot or the characters involved. And situational irony is used. Uh, this is one way that the author creates some humor in the stories, things that you don't expect. Um, for example, we have the stop sign. Uh, you have to stop there, but you can't turn left, right, go forward, or go back. So basically you stop there and what are you supposed to do? Um, 
kind of interesting. And then there's also uh, the picture of the thank you for driving carefully with right behind it a car that tipped over. So you would not expect those two things to be in such close proximity. Symbolism is another literary tool used by the author to help us learn about Christopher and his likes, his dislikes, and how he perceives the world. Uh, he has some colors that have some very strong meaning for him, and he also has symbols or um, processes or, or uh, activities he does with family members that show that they connect with each other, that they love each other, or if they're unhappy with each other. So the symbols help show or represent characters' mental state during the, the story. So, now that you're familiar with these literary terms, some of them are new, some of them are not new, um, you will be asked about these terms as you read the book and as you complete uh, the study guide chapters one through, or not chapters, I'm sorry, assignments one through eight. And um, best wishes, good luck, and we'll be talking about this uh, for the next couple weeks. Thank you.